Good morning. Welcome at the eighth Tito's here in Eindhoven in the Fontes for the seventh time. And uh, I must say I'm grateful for all the sponsors we have because without them this event would not be possible. And we have a big event this time. We've got five tracks over two days with more than 40 speakers and more than 50 talks. So I hope you all enjoy yourself today and tomorrow if you come back. And upstairs we have two tracks for uh, one for the NLGG guys, one for the open source in education. And they have even an open source class demonstration set up there. So if you are interested in that stuff, just go and have a look at them. It's really nice. The social event is tonight, and there's still some room, so if you want to attend, please go to the bar and buy a ticket. And I think till one o'clock or so, there are enough tickets. After that, you've got bad luck. And then I go to the last part of my presentation. That's announcing the speaker for today, our keynote speaker, Joris Verborg. He's going to talk about the Internet of Things. And Give him a big applause. <laughs> All right, thanks, Jean Paul. Let's see if we can get this thing working here. Um, let me see. It should work. With my new multi monitor Mavericks install. Wow. Good morning, everybody. Good to see you all showed up in this early hour because it's, it was a late nighter for me. <laughs> but uh, I tried to be here on time. I, mean, I tried to be a, I tried to prepare an interesting talk for you, um, open source community. I'm Joris Verbocht. I'm the CTO of a company called Notificare. Um, and I'd like to talk to you today about the Internet of Things or whatever that's connected to the open source community. So before we start, I'd like to tell a little story that I saw in the past. I studied in Delft, and this was in the 90s. So uh, around 19, I think 96, 95, 96, there was a group in uh, Delft that called itself Ubicom, which I think, if I remember correctly, stands for Ubiquitous Communication. So what these guys were doing is, trying to think of, you know, the web just took off, it was 1996, I mean, everybody started to have dial-up accounts, there was stuff like in Holland, the Digitale Stadt, you had access for all people at CompuServe, dial-up connections. So it pretty much took off from there for everybody, ex you know, outside of universities. So what they thought was, let's see what we can do if we, you know, think through of these technologies and how they're gonna invade the rest of our physical world. So I tried to look it up what they were doing actually and I find a quote you know from their the abstract from a paper they did which says in the vision of you become a user carries a wearable terminal and a lightweight see-through display. In this display the user can see virtual information that augments reality projected over and properly integrated with the real world. The wearable system contains a radio link that connects the user to the ubiquitous computing resources and the internet. Well, when I read that one, I was like, kind of sounds familiar, right? Because there's stuff like this right now. And actually, I think what, what Google built was what they predicted, or not only them, but a lot of people predicted in the 90s that would be possible, you know, a wearable device that augments virtual stuff over reality. By the way, I love the mustache. I want to grow one like that. Um, so... From that moment on, there was, I think there was two big promises because we had the internet, there was the web, there was browsers, things took off. And there were still two big promises there. And I think um, the most important ones are we would get like a semantic web. So um, I probably don't have to explain this to you guys here. but um, So instead of just having all those web pages and saying, well, okay, I put my stuff up there, you put your stuff up there, let's hyperlink our stuff, we also want to create like a meaningful relationship between those different pieces of content on the web. And I think we're getting there. Doesn't 
work the way we expected to, to work uh, back in the 90s, but we're getting there. And I think the second one that came up back then was a term coined the Internet of Things, right? So the idea that you would have all these devices that are out there, your screens, your mobile phones, your, I don't know, furniture, sensors, lights, uh, computers, your, you know, um, even clothing, you know, stuff like glasses or your shoes or your car, you know, anything that you could think of in the physical world to hook it up through a network connection. So you could create like kind of a virtual layer on top of the physical reality. Which I think is also a thing that's happening right now. Maybe we're already in this virtual layer. But So I want to focus on those two, two things and, and see what we can do as an open source community about this because I think um, we're not doing enough there. So first of all, why do I think the Internet of Things is there? I mean, there's a low, co uh, a low power, low cost, but powerful enough devices. So it's, you don't need to wear, you know, there used to be guys who had like backpacks full of equipment and walk around with huge lenses on their, on their glasses. And this was kind of the, you know, precursor of, uh, of Google Glass. But now everyone has like, a, a, you know, a thing like this in their pocket, which is a kind of a, compared to the 60s supercomputers, I mean, it's amazing. They, even the stuff we had in the early 90s is, 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 you know, just rubbish con compared to what we carry in our pockets every day. And then there's standards to uh, connect this stuff locally. I mean, not only phones or computers, you know, not screens, but just sensors. You know, there's stuff like Zigbee, and we already had like Bluetooth and, wi and you know, regular Wi-Fi. Um, so this is all standards, and we're starting to see that different devices from different brands and different manufacturers and different types of devices are actually able to communicate with one another, be it on a protocol level. I'll get to that later. And then there's standards to connect to, let's say, brokers. So there's uh, 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 broker architectures out there that you can use, be it locally or over the Internet, and there's a couple of them. And then there's ways of connecting those systems to one another, right? So there's APIs, we have REST and SOAP and stuff, you know, there's emerging standards there, which is a good thing. So we're, I'm, I think we're getting there. So before I continue on what we can do about this, let's first take a look at current state of affairs, right? I mean, the internet is everywhere. I mean, literally, I mean, this is, a, I don't know if you can see this and recognize it, but this is a scene from um, um, a minority report. So in which, this is the, you know, the movie that everybody always refers to. So I thought, let's put in a, in a picture of that one too. So, you know, there's screens all around you. There's people talking about, you know, the walls are all going to be connected and there's going to be screens of, I don't know, e-ink or some, you know, other marvelous technology that's going to emerge in the next couple of years. So you can see everywhere you walk past a, a table or past a screen or past a wall and it talks to you and says, hi, yours, this is uh, your latest offer, just come here and if you walk in now you get a free coffee or whatever. It's kind of creepy uh, in some points, but I think it's reality, right? I mean, there's sensors everywhere, there's, you walk around with a sensor every day. I mean, it's possible to know your whereabouts and where you go and what you're doing all day long, all year long. You can disconnect, of course, but I think this is not a a, a practical solution. You cannot just, you know, Leave it like this. I mean, this is reality, guys. This is what's happening. And then there's amazing technology coming out of all this. I mean, there is a, this is an autonomous driving car by, I like this one better than the Prius by uh, Google. So I thought I'd put in an Audi. Um, so, you know, this is, this is amazing. I mean, there's cars that still look like, this is kind of, I don't know why they still look like uh, 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 existing cars, but probably otherwise nobody will buy them. I mean, they drive by themselves, and it's reality. It's not even in 10 years, it's there. You can just, you could, if car manufacturers decided today to only sell cars that drive themselves, it would be possible within the next couple of years. So, the question is, I think, for a lot of people, and maybe even for, for you guys, I don't know, um, is technology taking over? You know, is there a, are we seeing that technology gets so smart and gets so sophisticated that it actually runs our lives even without us knowing it? Well, I don't know. 
um, more important question is, if it is, can we trust it? Right? Can, are we the ones who can trust technology doing the stuff for us while we go on with our lives, I mean, whatever it is we're doing? And I think it's not a question of if we can, or, but are we already trusting it? Because my cousin works for, um, um, let's say for Tenet, I don't know if you guys know this. This is the company that takes care of all the electricity, you know, distribution of electricity in, um, in this country. And it's perfectly normal for every one of us, I mean, to wake up in the morning, switch on, do an, switch on the light switch, and there's electricity, there's light. You know, you can switch on your coffee machine and it's there. There's hot water running from the tap. And I mean, even coming back to electricity, it always works. Sometimes there's, you know, there's major failures, but those are major failures and exceptions because those failures in those systems happen all every day, all over the day. There's thousands of these incidents every year in, uh, all over the country. There's millions of these incidents every year of stuff failing, and it just keeps working. I mean, the internet itself is built as a redundant technology, right? So we rely, we're already relying on technology taking care of a lot of the stuff we don't want to think about, right? So there's people who don't trust this. There's people who don't like this. I mean, there's guys like this. I don't know if you saw that um, guys on Facebook. There's a family, um, uh, McConnell's from uh, Toronto in Canada. I mean, Canadians are crazy. I mean, look at the hair of the guy. But I mean, so what they decided to... Um, um, it was for their kids. I mean, it kind of made, made sense what they were saying. Um, they wanted to live like they used to live in 1986, right, I believe. So uh, only um, uh, Nintendo games, um, only cassettes, videos, no internet, no computer, no mobile phones. I think they even uh, ditched the GPS from their car and <laughs> started using, you know, all big uh, rope maps to, uh, to drive to tell, to, you know, somehow keep their kids from kind of um, the madness that they thought was the stuff like social networking like Facebook. Well, that kind of reminds me of, you know, the, those guys, you know, in, um, in the US there's um, uh, groups like the Amish that, you know, refuse to, you know, just use any technology that comes out there. They first discuss within their community whether or not technology will or will not benefit um, uh, their community. So they're still like, you know, they're driving. <laughs> it's kind of funny because they have carts with horses, but they still have, they already have the lights and they have to, you know, comply to all the uh, traffic regula regulations there in the, in the US. Um, and it's their way of life, but I'm not sure if this is a way you should approach this because technology is growing so fast and it's expanding and it's, exp it's expanding in our lives. And I think if you just ignore it, the power of this is so huge that it will take over society or at least our physical world and it will influence everybody. You cannot escape this. I mean, you can, okay, there's one thing you can do. You can become a hermit. Not sure if there's enough caves in the world for everybody to, to live in, but you could do this, of course. And, but even then, I'm not sure if this is gonna, you know, you can ignore the fact that technology is so overwhelmingly persistent in uh, in society so everybody's using it right i mean we're using it for this people are using technology to you know communicate to one another but ignoring the people that are sitting next to them so so i'm getting to my point what i was thinking is why not should we let technology improve our lives because i don't think we are currently doing this right now i mean we're using technology. I mean, it takes over a lot of the um, stuff every day that we don't want to take care of. Like, is there electricity? You don't want to, you know, put on the coal in the uh, 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 in your ovens and fire it up every day. You don't want to walk to uh, to your work. You don't want to uh, uh, have to, you know, uh, uh, start your car by hand and stuff. So this old technology that, that we take for granted, which are making our lives a little bit more comfortable, but. Does it actually improve our lives? Because I think what we're seeing now is people using internet for, you know, communicating and making sure they get up to date of everything. So now you have uh, email, and because email is, uh, there's overwhelming email, so now you have to set up rules, and then you're going to send yourself a, 
a push message when there is an important message, so you have to take care of that. And then now there's different inboxes you have, so instead of empty, zeroing, zeroing one inbox, you now have to empty four because you never know, maybe there's still an email that come, came into the, the other mailbox that you thought you were going to ignore, but yeah, hey, what, what do you know? So people spend a lot of time every day to keep up with this endless stream of information. It doesn't get any less, it gets more and more and more and more, and it starts to overwhelm us. So why couldn't we use the technology to take care of this stuff for us, right? So we actually have enough spare time to do the things we really want to do, you know? Spend time with our families, or I don't know, make a painting, write a poem, write a book, uh, I don't know, whatever you want to do, write some marvelous piece of software. And so my question is, are we going to let this happen by companies like this? I mean, you all know the Terminator series, so... Um, and I think this is, I'm not saying this is a serious threat right now, but I think if you leave this up to companies like Google, even if they're doing great stuff on, you know, in, in open sourcing a lot of their technologies, it's not about the technology, it's about who controls the resources of that technology. Are we going to leave it up to Google? Because it's free. You know, everybody uses Google because it's free. Everybody uses Facebook because it's free. But it's not. You're actually giving them enough data to actually control a large part of society. I'm not saying that's what they are they're after, but they have the capabilities. And are we going to leave it up to those companies or are we going to somehow use open source and use the open source community? So I'm talking about you guys to actually add to this and even compete with companies like Google um, on the level of, you know, integrating this virtual layer on top of the physical world. Let me get a drink. So, um, what do we need for this, right? There's a, a thing on, on connecting stuff and connecting devices that is, let's say, made up of three layers. So I would say you need logic, right, to, to hook up the stuff. You need semantics, so you have to give some meaning in the connection between those devices. And... If you really want to make it work for itself and for us, we need some intelligence to this. So logic is, I think, for how many of you guys are actually developers, programmers? Right. Okay, so you, you guys know what I'm talking about. Um, there's a lot of things going on on the, on the web about hooking up different pieces of, you know, of technology out there. And there's one example I always come across, and let's just use that one as an example. Sive, TTT or whatever you, how you pronounce it. It's if this, then that. Which is a really simplistic way of describing what, you know, logic is. But, I mean, it's a form of logic, right? So, wow, this is fantastic. You can now do stuff like this. If um, it says if the current temperature rises above 25 degrees Celsius, then send a blink event. You know that blink, this is a multicolor um, uh, LED you can connect, hook up to your USB port. And it's an amazing stuff, and, and it works. So now, what happens if the temperature drops below 10? Or where do you measure this temperature? In Eindhoven? What if I move to Amsterdam? Do I have to set up a new rule? I have to think of this all ahead. So I have to... It's getting even worse. I don't even... Not only have to worry about the information that's coming to me, I also have to think about how to route all this information to me. I have to come up with this myself. And then there's, there's stuff like... Tools like Zapier. Um, I have a screenshot of this one. It says... There's four zaps that you can make. There's one Asana tasks being created from Asana tasks. You guys know Asana? It's a, let's say, a, a, a work group based or community based uh, um, task list. And it's a nice software. I like, I like their, uh, uh, their way of approaching stuff. And then there's one if you want to send a message on Google Talk. And then there's one if a message on Google Talk comes in, make it an Asana task. Or you can even have Google Talk messages create Google Talk messages, right? Stuff like this. So this is for two services. You know, we all had permutations in school, right? So you can imagine if you have four or five or ten 
or 25 services that you use online and you want to hook them all up. You know the number of combinations, even if you chain them together into events. So the problem with this is that you still have to think as a human being on what do I want if this and this happens in, in my life? And it's, yeah, I mean, there's some situations where it will definitely work. Of course, because there's manual repetition that you do every day and you can automate this. But still, it doesn't take care for you of this burden. You still have to think about online services, which is, come to think of it, kind of really, I mean, there's even stuff like, ex, what's it called? Exively, I don't know how, how to pronounce this. But they have, they can hook up different devices all over the place from di with different protocols. There's, there's, there's a, an Android library and an iOS library and an Arduino library and the list goes on and on and on, which is perfect. But you still have to, you know, program all this stuff for the different platforms. So, for me, this all comes down to programming. And programming is a hard task. Even if people say, well, IFTTT is so easy. Of course, it's easy. But the, the problem with programming is not that you, <laughs> you cannot build it. The problem is you have to define the problem first. So you can come up with all these kinds of recipes, and there's all kinds of funny recipes on, on IFTTT, and all kinds of zaps on uh, Zapier, and all kinds of ways of hooking up devices on Xively. But still, you have to define and decide yourself which recipes you're going to use. So what I don't understand is why are we not thinking the next step in why do we have to write this logic ourselves? So what if we have you know, add semantics to this, right? There's, there's all, we walk around every day and you have your devices, you have your service that you run online. There's all kinds of meaning to the data you have in there. There's all kinds of meaning in, in events that happen around you. I mean, then we come to talk like stuff like big data. I mean, the Internet of Things is all about this. I mean, there's, you can put sensors in this stage all over the place. You can put sensors all over the city. So it generates a huge amount of data. What's the meaning of that data? And again, there's companies like this who are the masters in big data. They're not giving away this big data to you. You generate big data for them and they, you know, they store it for you, but they don't give it back to you. There's no way for you to retrieve your big data you give to Google. There's no way you give to retrieve your big data you give to Facebook. They process this, turn this into a format that they decide you might find interesting. Which is not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, it's their business, right? I have nothing against Google as a company. And I don't have anything against Google even as a, you know, the, the things they are doing and the fact that they are using the data I gather to make money. I mean, this is not a problem. But are we leaving it up to those companies to actually gather that data and add meaning to it. Why should Google be the one who defines what the meaning of my data is? And then there's the point of intelligence. I mean, also in that area, Google is king, right? Because they have the resources. They have so many resources to add intelligence to their systems. I mean, they built the autonomous driving cars. They built you know, on top of, why do you think they built these cars? Where do you think because they want to build a car? Of course, this is, it's a nice thing to do. But of course, they're going to use all the lessons they learned from this to process data and to derive some, you know, predictions from this. Because this is what the autonomous cars do, right? They scan the environment and from this they predict what they should do. Should they brake? Should they accelerate? Should they turn left? Should they turn right? Should they blink their light? Should they blow the horn? Should they stop? Whatever. And again, are we leaving it up to those companies and we are all happy, hey, Google released just another API that we can use. Well, but again, it's them deciding what they give you back in those APIs. And actually, they're using their APIs, I think, to gather even more data uh, from you, which is, not again, not necessarily a bad thing. But they're not helping you. And they are if they are the only ones doing it, I'm not sure if this is the best way of doing stuff. So my question is, are we going to pre-program everything, you know, just write code and, you know, hook up all those APIs and, yay, I'm a developer and I can do this? Or are we going to be smart and somehow try to gain knowledge ourselves from the stuff we are doing and share that knowledge with other systems? Right? So, 
why can't we not do the same things? I mean, of course, you don't have the resources like a big company like Google. I'm, I'm using Google as an example because they are the biggest ones. Or even the NSA, uh, come to think of big data. Um, why can't we do the same things they are doing? Why can we not together, you know, there's a network out there, there's lots of people out there, lots of smart people all over the world that are not working for Google. Why can't those people together not come up with a system that shares knowledge of out of big data they generate? Why do we have to first give it to Google and have them decide what the knowledge is that comes out of that data? So what's holding this back? Right? Why aren't we doing this? I think there's a couple of reasons because first of all there's a ecosystems, you know, there's stuff like what Apple is doing, but also Android and the stuff Google is doing. It's all ecosystems, right? And then there's, talking about Internet of Things, there's companies like, I think Philips is doing the, what's it called? The lighting they are doing, uh, the uh, the Hue, which is a nice idea, but it only, only works with their lights. <laughs> you know, and you can only hook up their lights. Well, you can try and hack into that box, but I mean, it's not, they're not in this business to open up the stuff. That's not what they're in. They're in this business to sell light bulbs. That's what they've always done. And I think the problem is there's closed data. Like I said, for the, the stuff you give to Google, it's in their servers and they are the ones who control this. I'm not saying they're doing evil things with it, but you are not the one who has access to that data. Why can't you just gather your own data and come up with your own knowledge from that data and give it to other systems and decide whatever you want to share instead of having another corporation in this case, decide for you what it is you want to share. And I think there's lack of programmers, which might, you know, solve itself if the um, system becomes smart enough to, um, to program themselves. But I think this is a real problem. I think we're leaving stuff up to um, programmers right now, which is, it's like, it's like, I think Douglas Rushkoff said, it's like the middle, uh, uh, the middle ages uh, uh, when we left, you know, writing, you know, and literature. And so let's say, um, the truth in, in, in writing and laws up to monks, you know, those were the ones who could write stuff and read stuff. Normal people couldn't write, they couldn't read. So they had to assume whatever everybody was to telling on stage or in a church was, was the truth. This radically changed when the printing press came. And everybody could get a copy of stuff without having to, you know, you know what the monks used to do, you know, write stuff and then write it there and then copy the books. All of a sudden, there were millions of copies of the same books right away, you know, that you could just print them. So that changed society, right? All of a sudden, everybody could read themselves and think for themselves what was in those texts. And people could write books and write their opinion and share their opinion on paper. And with internet, it's even easier. You can share your stuff with everybody around the world. So for programmers, it's the same. Right now, we are kind of the wizards, you know, of the 21st century. You know, for most people, if they see programmers, they're like, I don't know what those guys are doing, because you're typing on the screen, and it's either a black screen or, or sometimes a white screen. You know, there's all letters there and, you know, cryptic codes in there and whatever they are doing and they do take a lick, a lick, a lick, a lick and they come out and then, ta-da, works on my iPhone. And actually, they don't give a shit what you're doing and how much time it took you. If it doesn't work, they're like, ah, it's crappy software. And if it works, they're like, oh, yeah, oh, you saw this too, oh, oh nice. Ah, the only thing I think they should have added this one. How they didn't think of this. Because this is, you know, people are leaving it up to programmers. So there's kind of a... Um, let's say, a responsibility on programmers to think of using this technology and think of, you know, um, come up with ways of improving technology instead of, you know, just leaving it. Because people are saying, I leave it up to Google because I don't have that time, I don't have the money, I don't have the resources. They are big and they're doing a good job. And it's true. But doesn't mean, I mean, this is what open source was always about, right? And I think it still is. We can do this together, right? We don't need huge corporations to do this for us. We can do it together. This is the power of numbers, right? And I think, especially from the point of open source, it's focused on technology and not on humans. I know we're all bad at, you know, uh, uh, we're not the best communicators in the world, right? We're not the best marketers in the world. We don't sell our stuff. 
we think it's not worth it. We like to share with our friends and our fellow developers, our fellow engineers. Share. You see what I did? Oh, really clever algorithm. And that's, and that's a good thing. But the thing is you have to think about how this technology is actually affecting a lot of stuff going on. And it's getting, you know, in, in let's say a hundred years ago, technology was, you know, mechanical engineering. You know, cars and ships and then became planes and rocket science and, but today it's software. Everything's controlled by software. I mean, the hardware is, it's all commodity, right? So, are we going to let software turn into a commodity being dictated by a couple of corporations? Or are we going to take control of the power of software and we're going to use it for good to change or at least improve lives of real people? So, come to my, the end of my talk. What can we do to solve it? And I think, first of all, Create standards, and I don't mean this in the way of creating standards like, okay, let's make a work group committee and then discuss for 15 years how we're going to standardize this. No, I think there's other ways of creating standards, and I think one of our good, uh, the good examples is the, you know, the HTML5 standard, whatever it is, is standard. But I think what's interesting here is the, um, the, the discussion or the, you know, even the fight between the W3C and the, uh, what WG on you know, there was two groups. One group said, okay, we're the guardians, W3C, we're the guardians of web technology. It should work like this because we have to make sure it'll still work in 25 years. They have, we have to get the semantics right. Documents have to be parsed correctly. And even they think if you use XHTML, if it doesn't, if it's not correct, the browser shouldn't even display it, which is of course bullshit because machines are going to get smart enough even already are, because browsers can display crappy HTML. You don't need this uh, structure. You don't have to be that rigorous. You have to think of how can we enable this technology and put it to work. That's what the, what the WG did. They said, well, okay, now we have these browsers. They're fast enough. They have a huge, people have a huge screen. They have variable devices. Let's use this technology. Let's use this computing power to do something nice, right? Like animations and, you know, location based stuff. If you leave it up to a work that discusses for 10 years, would have never been there. Just, just browser vendors that put it in there. And because of the internet, you can communicate within a day all over the world. And you can get to some consensus. There's problems there, I see. And there's a huge debate going on whether or not you should do CSS like this or do like this. But this is all minor details, right? You can create standards by just coming up with something and discuss and adapt and try to get to a point where everybody can at least agree to a subset of what, uh, uh, of, of, of what you are doing. And then, I don't know, you know this painting? It's the, it's a, uh, a Euronis bus painting. It's the, it's Babel, you know. Babel is the, you know, the biblical um, tower where people built this tower to reach up to God and then they, they don't understand each other because they all speak in different languages and, uh, you know, it's the, you know the biblical story. But this is the point. There's no, Esperanto in the, you know, in, 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 especially in the Internet of Things. And I'm not sure if we need to, right? I mean, do we need one language? Do we need one way of communicating? I mean, there's the United Nations who have like, I don't know, they have like what, 10 working languages or something. There's, I mean, there's translators there because you add the meaning to this and try to define your stuff in a way that other people can understand. So, if you add semantics to your data, if you add semantics to the stuff you're outputting to somebody else, you can talk, right? I mean, people can communicate in different languages, so why do we need one language? I mean, you can be the translator between two different systems. Why not? Why can't you be in between and, you know, translate the data you have and come up with some meaning and attach it to that and Tell it in a way that other systems can understand, like you would do if you speak a different language or if you're from different cultures. So, what I would like to see is that systems online are going to share knowledge and not just share data. I mean, APIs are easy. Like you can just look up API documentation, this URL, I do this, HTTP post, and then, bam, I send you data. And this is the formats and the JSON, XML, whatever you want. But this is just data exchange. Again, this is 
helping those systems, telling those systems how to communicate. Why not come up with systems that can talk to one another without you having to program that stuff? I mean, it's possible. Systems are smart enough. Systems are fast enough. There's technologies out there to do this. And if they're not there, why not invent those technologies? So it's kind of the thing I'm getting to is kind of a plea. In the open source community should realize they are a powerful community. They can, you know, they are the ones who understand the technology, right? Normal people don't understand shit. They think they do because they have a smartphone, but they don't understand. They would not know how, where to start and how to do stuff. So are we going to leave it up to certain corporations to do this for us? Or is the open source community going to be the ones that are going to wake up and say, wait a minute. We are the ones who can control this technology. It's not owned by corporations. It's not owned by a certain company. It's not owned by the NSA. We don't have to lose our lives to technology because a lot of people are afraid that, you know, internet technology and, you know, artificial intelligence will take over society. I'm not sure if this is going to happen. I mean, if we are the ones who built this artificial intelligence, why would it be something that we cannot control? I mean, we all know the Skynet, you know, stories from Terminator, but if I think if you leave it up to one corporation, the chance is a bigger chance that it is going to be used for bad things than if we come up with something that we can at least put, you know, put next to this as an open source uh, community. Okay, I want to leave it with that. Thank you. Oh, by the way, I have a um, this is a kind of a, um, so you might wonder, I don't know, but you might wonder what we are doing. Uh, the company I work for, the company I own, we send push messages out to connect people to where they are and any of their devices, right? So what we eventually want to do is enable people to um, take action on stuff they get in and eventually, you know, you want to build like a personal assistant, right? This is, I think... You cannot, as a human being, gather all this information from the web. You have to filter stuff out. And somehow, I would love to see, for myself at least, have like an agent that goes online and, you know, discusses stuff for me. At least on the, you know, the normal things, right? Just, you know, agenda meetings and stuff. Now that I don't have control over this, but I, I can trust um, intelligence that works for me online instead of, you know, companies that come up with stuff that I have to trust what they put in there. Right. If you want to reach me, these are my uh, things. Thank you.